Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the executive editor for Data Diversity. Today, Karen will discuss cross databases. Where do we do the modeling part? Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. And we very much encourage you to chat with us and with each other throughout the webinar. To do so, click the chat icon in the top right for that feature. For questions, we'll be collecting them by the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag HeartData. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the recording of the session and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce our speaker for today, Karen Lopez. She is a Senior Project Manager and Architect at Info Advisors. She has 20 plus of years experience in project and data management on large multi-project programs. Karen specializes in the practical application of data management principles. She is a frequent speaker, blogger, and panelist. Karen is known for her fun and sometimes snarky observations on data and data management. Mostly, she wants everyone to love their data. You can follow her at, at DataChick on Twitter. And Karen, um, hello and welcome. Hi, Shannon. Thank you so much for that, and thank you for being here to help make this happen. I also want to thank everyone for showing up today. Um, don't know what the weather's like where you are. Well, I know we're a little bit, for those of you who shared in the chat, what the weather was like. Um, but today, my voice is a little weak, so I'm going to keep trying to uh, try to speak up. But if I get too quiet, just someone put something in chat and say, you can't hear my voice. That would be helpful. Okay. So we're going to talk about graph databases a bit today. And please do tweet um, your comments. Live tweeting about this. Always love that. So we've been through my bio. But one of the things I wanted to point out is um, graph databases are really new to me. I don't have um, clients who are currently implementing them directly. I have in the past, but um, I think one of the things I'm going to talk about today is sort of the maturity level of this specific type of NoSQL database. So normally I'd, I'd do a poll here, but I've got a lot to cover. and. I'm going to ask you some questions as we go along instead of doing the formal poll. So don't forget to put your formal questions that you'd like for me to answer in the Q&A and then chat with each other and potentially chat with me in the actual chat box. So those are two separate things. And um, yes, there will be slides distributed early next week and a recording. So why this topic? Well, I started, um, I've done a few topics through the series about NoSQL resources, so non-relational or features within relational DBMSs that um, expand beyond the relational world. And there's a lot of, I just got back from EDW, which was co-hosted with NoSQL Now. And so I thought that was a great move because now we had mixed audiences of people, work, some working with traditional relational databases, both in the transactional and the data warehousing or BI world or analytics, people, and also people who were living and breathing and doing lots of work in the NoSQL world. Um, one of the interesting things that has happened in the market for NoSQL databases is if I'd given this presentation last year, there'd just be a handful of uh, databases or data stores or database engines that one could use with uh, Graph, and we're going to talk about some of those. But something that's happened in the last few months or the last year is that more and more companies have either announced new Graph databases to be downloaded and installed, or Graph database services, so databases as a service, um, and we're going to talk about some of those as well. I think this is a key indicator that if we have our traditional relational databases adding graph features, if we have sort of the big um, technology software companies um, announcing either graph databases or graph services or graph services that sit on top of their other technologies, that this is a sign that the enterprise world, that it's time to be thinking about what sort of data stories you have that would might better fit into the graph world. So I'm going to spend um, some time doing the introduction to graph stuff, 
as well as talking about how we've solved that problem in the relational world and how we still can do it, as well as how we're going to end up maybe not using our, our relational databases and some of the options. I'm not going to be doing any demos today, but I have some screenshots from a couple of graph products, and I'm going to talk about two major approaches to graph databases. Um, and the whole point of this is not to highlight those products, but to show you how it differs than, say, traditional SQL queries or the ways that we interact with data. And then, of course, every good speaker leaves you with some resources. And the reason this is important is that I believe that modern data architectures, and therefore modern data architects and modelers, will be, have expertise in hybrid technologies. And that includes both relational and non-relational. So I already work with data architects that work with non-relational technologies like, let's say, IMS as a pre-relational system, or XML, which is a non-relational both data store and messaging system and standard um, that, oh no, sorry about that, that a non-relational system and those that we'll be, take, we'll be taking a look at are just a representation of some of the ways that our jobs are going to change. So I'd like to clarify some terminology in that, um, so there's graphs, Graph is a math concept, it's a networking concept, there's the social graph, there are, there's graph theory, and we have graph databases. Um, typically, we use that to mean any sort of technology solution that has graph-like thinking to it and graph-like querying to it. Um, but typically, today, when I say graph database, I mean one that is natively storing data as a graph in a couple of major ways. Then there's graph processing. So we can do graph processing on, tops of, on top of all kinds of data. So if we look at the major pieces of what NoSQL means, if it means not only SQL, is that there's relational, there's graph, there's columnar, column family, key value, document, there's also Hadoop, there's also hybrid versions of all these things. Um, and these are not necessarily types of databases because what we're seeing now is more and more systems are implementing a couple of these things together. So as an overview of sort of some graph theory. So one type of graph database is a property graph that um, if you think about it, a graph has, in traditional theory about graph theory, we have nodes, and those nodes have relationships. So the most common graph that you've worked with, that you work with in your, o your own life and everything, is a hierarchy. But I'm going to talk a little bit about hierarchies in a minute. A hierarchy is just a specialized form as a graph. So if I have things that are related to each other, a hierarchy has special rules. So typically, a hierarchy, um, you know, in a, what we think of a hierarchy, we think of it as a tree, even though that's not the official definition. So we think of things having parents. So we think about family hierarchies. We think about departmental hierarchies. We talk about organizational hierarchies, any of those things. Graphs can be directed or undirected. So directed meaning the relationships between the nodes have a direction that's meaningful or things can just be related. So if we look at the hierarchical structure on the left, so this might be a typical reporting structure. We have generals and colonels and captains and sergeants and privates. And this is normally how we'd represent position or job hierarchies or reporting op um, opportunities at work. But I have always figured out I've, I've always dealt with hierarchies, is that they are so rare. We want our human psychology, we want our world to be ordered. We want to be able to say, you know, a captain always reports to a colonel, and a colonel always reports to a general. But what we find is, in the real world, people tend not, the real world doesn't fit in a clean hierarchy 
unless that real world is something we construct from a hierarchy. So if you think like the classification of species or certain um, library and records keeping systems that are, you know, a, a structured hierarchy to them, the reason we're able to do that is because we make the rule first and then we wedge everything in. But that's when we find, um, like in a hierarchy of species, is that things really aren't that strict. So we have this definition of mammals, of uh, animals that have live births, who breastfeed, who have endoskeletons. I can't remember, it's been a long time since I was in a biology class. But then we have things like platypuses or other things that don't have live births, but we still consider them mammals because they don't fit into this structure that we applied to it. So we find in the real world that in a reporting structure, we also have matrix reporting or secondments, or we have people sharing positions or any of those things. So we end up with these also reports to lines. And the way we typically do that in our HR database is we might create another table for all these exceptions because we've built, and I'll show you in a little bit, a strict hierarchy to it. Then the other thing we have to deal with uh, when we think about hierarchies is there's all these types of them. There's binary trees where every node is split into exactly two nodes. So one node only has one parent and one parent only has two child nodes. And then we have, uh, we can have binary trees that have to be balanced so that if we add a grandchild, we can't add great grandchildren until we've added children, so that's typically a bee tree or something like that. And we deal with this thing called ragged hierarchies, which is a huge problem, a huge, it's not a problem, it's a challenge. Um, let me see if I can move that next time. It's a challenge in, um, dealing with relational because it means to go find all the leaf nodes, all the nodes at the bottom, we end up having to, um, we end up having to scan through every single row in a table to go find all the way down. And that's not a bad thing, it's just a costly thing. So, the other thing about hierarchies is, so if we have a typical component breakdown that we have vehicles that are made up of engines and entertainment systems, um, and then we decide to introduce a new level, like uh, an injection system, um, that means, sorry, that we end up creating a new level, so the fan and the fan belt people get a new sibling called injection system, and now we have to move everything down. And when I get to the data model, those of you, I mean, most of you know how that we implement a hierarchy. This inserting a new level in the middle and moving everything down ends up moving a lot of data. So how we model in relational. So the number one way we model a hierarchy or even a network in relational is we do a recursive relationship, also called a self-join. Uh, some people call it a dog ear or a mouse ear. Um, if the relationship, if it's a, really a bill of materials relationship, which almost all of these are, which means a component is made up of components and those components um, can also be part of other components where we end up having this many-to-many -many relationship, that's what we implement. But when we try to implement a purely recursive thing, where we say an employee is managed by another employee, the way we build that is by having a foreign key that points back to the same entity or same table. And what that, that's why it's called either a mouse ear, dog ear, or recursive. I think we've come up with a lot of different ways of, of doing that. But it also means that the guy at the top who doesn't report to anybody, um, it means that, you know, we have to create this, oh, sorry, we have to create this um, null. We have to say the CEO reports to nobody. But what that also means is we could end up with somebody, 
we could end up with someone down below also not reporting to anybody just because the data is missing. Um, and then the other thing that happens. So we have employee number one who is the CEO. He has reporting to him, the vice president of sales. He has no one else reporting to him. Um, but reporting to the vice president of sales, we can see is the marketing manager, the North American sales manager, the Pacific sales manager. Um, and then we just have these people reporting to each other all over the place. But what happens if now, instead of just a vice president of sales, now we want to have, and um, we want to appoint maybe directors in there. That means we would insert a row with the directors, and we would literally have to go through and move all the, the children of vice president of sales to their appropriate director. And often that type, you know, this looks really simple in a short table like this, but we end up with another way, uh, another sort of complete scan of the table to clean it all up, um, and, and as well as we can't do updates to the table at the same time, so literally we have to, you know, not let anyone uh, make any updates to this table and any other tables. Think about all the other stuff that can happen. So uh, something that happens in real life, like adding a new level or taking a level away or promoting someone causes all this to happen. So the way we get around some of that stuff is in a relational database is sometimes we have special data types or we can use a process called adjacency lists or path enumerations or closure tables or nested sets. Now, I'm not going to go through all those because we're not here really to talk about all the ways we go about uh, doing hierarchies, but at the end of the deck in resources, um, if you want to implement these, which I highly, highly recommend, is there is a, a book, Joe Selko has a book called Trees and Hierarchies, and again, that's going to be listed at the end, um, that to tells you how to implement these sort of performance tuning as well as workarounds so that you're not constantly iterating through every single row on the table to do a query. And these are literally tricks that we're doing in a relational database to make what looks like a hierarchy work well and perform well. But if we go back to this and you realize we don't really have as many hierarchies as we thought, what we really have is a many-to-many -many relationship. So like a bill of materials. So we have an employee can report to many employees and a employee can have many employees reporting to them. That's a many to many. So here's one of the weird things about the relational model. The reason we have to do this, we have to create a brand new entity in order to model this, is that we're really now keeping information about that relationship, the relationship between employees. Indeed, one of the number one reasons why employees report to other employees and have many employees reporting to them is the whole concept of that reporting structure changing over time. So we have to create this separate table and then maintain it, and then we have to do all these other tricks to make sure that we don't have um, you know, a director reporting to a VP, but that VP reporting to one of the director's reports. I mean, in theory that could happen, but now we have to do all of this stuff outside of the database. And we'll talk about why we have to do this. So here's an example of, sorry. Here's an example of a reporting structure, so we have George who runs a small savings and loan, and um, he's got Tilly who reports to him as an assistant, and Clarence and Billy and Mary report to him, and Bert and Ernie and Janie and Petey and Tommy and Zuzu all report to Mary. But in the real world, I'm just going to try to stop that. In the real world, there, it's not just a simple reporting structure. So we actually know that people are related to people, they report to people, they might be married to them, um, one of them might have a bodyguard role, one of them might be an administrative assistant for it. So what you can see is this hierarchy that we have in our mind that we've modeled is really a graph. 
And the reason I'm going through all this is that when people tell me we don't really have any graph stories yet, data stories, I believe that every, every enterprise has graph data, whether it's their master data or their products and services or their HR reporting, is that I can guarantee you that every enterprise, every enterprise data model has a great data story for graph. And that's just by me picking on the hierarchies. There are other reasons. So the other way we deal with this traditionally a recursive relationship in the relational world. I'm just showing here um, from SQL Server a function, a CLR, that's written just to manage how you query and deal with um, this inner joins, all these union alls, to go find all of the direct reports. And the reason someone might do that is so that you don't have every single developer having to write this logic. And this is just a snippet of it, by the way. So the other types of recursives in real life that we have are facilities. So buildings are made up of rooms, are made up of areas, are made up of warehouses, and warehouses have special um, storage locations that have certain properties. Documents, another thing that look hierarchical, but then we reuse parts of paragraphs or standard disclaimers across many documents. So a section of a document can appear in many documents. And then real legit networks, like our IT networks or our phone networks or our people networks. So the ultimate graph that everyone likes to talk about is the social graph, so Twitter and all of these things. But that's kind of a cheat because, you know, the first time someone in the enterprise says, oh, you need graphs so you can keep track of Twitter stuff, someone says, yeah, sometime in my spare time. What I'm trying to tell you is your enterprise data is also a graph. Another trick that we do, so in SQL Server and other DBMSs have this too, is they have a special data type called hierarchy ID, and it's attempt to solve this problem. So you can see that you can um, have, I can create this table, it has an employee ID, and I've given it a specific data type called hierarchy ID. And this is so that behind the scenes, there's a function that SQL Server manages so that you can insert things into the hierarchy and then use these types of language uh, query things to say, go get me, uh, get me the ancestor of this, so the parent, get me the children of this, tell me what level this thing is, tell me what the top level of is. Um, and then there's all these other things about reparenting it and, and parsing it and reading it. This was an attempt by Microsoft to try to make dealing with hierarchies easier. The problem is virtually no one uses it because the performance of this is not that great. And so it doesn't scale well. So if you had a really short um, hierarchy, you might use it like all the departments. So by short, I mean not too many levels and not too many rows. Some people will ask me, well, isn't, a relational database about relation. And I think that's one of the biggest myths is that relational databases aren't about relationships. That word relation comes from the fact that in the relational model, the tables, and I know it's they're not really tables, but the tables um, are relations. And the links between our tables or our entities are just constraints. We call them relationships in our modeling tool. We call them, um, we give them names that work just like in a graph. You know, we say reports to and everything. But under the covers and everything, those lines between our boxes are constraints. Constraints are wonderful. That's how we get great data quality. It's how we keep from having a whole bunch of invoice lines without an invoice or a whole bunch of um, email addresses that don't belong to a customer. But that's a constraint. One of the other features of a relational database is because it's a constraint, we can't put any properties or attributes on it. So there are modeling techniques, notably um, the Chen data modeling notation, which allowed us to create um, relationships, give them names, and have the relationships have properties. That's all great, but if we 
then go to implement it in a relational database, it's typical for these lines to just be implemented as constraints or for us to create an entity between these two entities or tables so that we can store properties, so that we can change the cardinality or enforce the cardinality. So if there's one thing I want you to take away from here is that relational databases aren't about relationships, they're about relations. And as Graham Simpson says in his normalization talks, the more you normalize, the more relations you get, just like in marriage. The more marriages you have, the more relations you get. So now we've talked about um, relational databases and the things we struggle with with trying to model relationships there, especially networks and hierarchies. Now let's talk a little bit about a property graph, a labeled property graph. So I'm taking this example from uh, sort of the notation, uh, sort of the nomenclature or the vocabulary that comes with Neo4j, which is one of the graph databases. Um, but the concepts here are the same. We have nodes, they have relationships, those relationships have directions, um, those relationships can have properties, and every node can have labels to it. So there can be multiple properties for a, and labels for a node and properties for a relationship. So think key value pairs. So, um, you know, I, Karen could be a node and I could have a, a name of Karen Lopez and I could have a, another property of my Twitter ID is data check. Um, nodes can have, be categorized or tagged via these labels. Relationships have a direction, just like in a data model. Um, relationships have these names. They have a start and an end node, so you can't just have a relationship hanging out there. So here's a, an example of, uh, here's a, uh, an example of a graph that has, the, so this one's a little bit easy. So it's unlike a data model, that circle in the middle, it's not an entity, it's an instance. So it's employee four. So let's just call employee four Karen. So that center node is Karen. Again, it's not an employee entity, it's Karen. And I can perform activity four, and I work as role four, um, which is a good thing because role four has a related activity of activity four. I'm part of team one. I have personal skill one. I have a degree three. I have another personal skill of four. I'm also, um, I used to work as role six, but now I work as role four. And then you can see that these relationships also have properties. So that how long, where did I work as role four? Now, one of the things that's hard to get your head around as a modeler is that you'll notice that some of the properties of these relationships have nouns on them. And that means that we would normally not think of a noun like location. So you see these locations here. And your question might be, why isn't there a location node? Well, this particular design, someone had to decide, meaning model, that we weren't going to necessarily worry about properties or locations. We were just going to make those, we weren't going to have, in our nomenclature in the data modeling world, attributes of locations. We were just going to list the location property off the relationship. Right there, that's a data modeling decision to deal with graph databases. So it's not a right or wrong answer, it was the right or wrong answer for this particular graph model and this particular graph. So another example from, uh, so Neo4j has some, um, just some sample graphs. They run competitions for people to make them and people try to make the, um, the most fun graphs, the most interesting ones. So does anyone recognize what these nodes might be? You could put that in the chat if you want. Um, I'm waiting for that chat to explode. This is one of my favorite things to use in a data model. Maybe that space side thing is an indicator. So what you see here is we have, yes, whiskeys and scotches. So there's a scotch just graph that you can go play with. Um, so you'll notice the red are the scotches 
the purple are, um, uh, okay, now I'm going to get this wrong. The purple are the locations. Now I can't remember now. Yes, a location. Um, the teal colored thing in the right is sort of the class, the type, which is also related to locations because that's how we do booze. But um, think of the blue, the purple as um, distilleries and uh, or locations and space side being a larger classification of it the a b and i the yellow circles are flavors so my guess is that we use a b and i here because it would be too hard to describe all the flavors and have them fit in this sort of little graph that are doing there yes whiskey distilleries a great data set to play with So, but what happens on, oh, there's one other type. So I showed you a property graph, another type of graph database that I haven't had a lot of experience with, so we're just going to get an overview of it, is a triple store. So triple store comes from the semantic world, and a triple store is called that because we basically write down facts about things, and it makes these really short sentences. So you have a noun, a verb, and an object or a verb phrase. So Ginger dances with Fred, Fred likes ice cream, and Karen loves data. We write all that stuff down and in that structure. And an individual triple, which is what we might call a row or an instance. See, the hard thing about talking about all these things is we, because we have so many types of NoSQL coming from all different parts of math or thinking or philosophy is that we now have similar words, they're not quite the same, but it can get confusing. I'm just going to apologize up front that I tend in these webinars and when I talk to put relational terminology on top of it. I know it's technically incorrect, but think of them as analogies. So each of these rows, Ginger dances with Fred, Fred likes ice cream, Karen loves data, is called a triple. And it's called a triple because it does subject, and then a verb, and then an object. Um, any one of those things, um, you know, semantically poor, but as you take them all together, if it said that Karen likes ice cream and Karen loves data and Karen dances with Fred, if you took all of those triples and then asked them some graph-like questions, like how many people does Karen dance with who also like ice cream, or how many people does, how many, let's see, we'll do, the, the ultimate graph story is the six degrees of Kevin Bacon, where you just want to know what's the shortest number of dance partners that Fred has to get between Karen and Ginger. Um, but taking this all together makes up this big graph. And in triple stores, we use RDF and XML Sparkle, which are uh, languages in order to query the triple stores. Neo4j, like I said, is a property graph. So it uses um, a, a language called Cypher to create the things. And you basically, it's a big text file. So for instance, in this particular example, we're creating um, a, a graph based on movies. And in this case, matrix and see, this is why it's such a great pun, because Neo, it was in Matrix, and their sample database and their documentation is all kinds of stuff about Matrix, the films. I think that's nice. So I'm creating a movie. It's got a title. It's got a year. I'm assuming that's when it was released. I'm creating actors, I'm cre and those actors have names. And then I'm saying which actors acted in which movies. Um, and then now I've started to build my graph. Now, one of the things, one of the key statements that most people say about graph databases is there's no data model. And the reason there's no data model, or the reason we would say that, one of these is the one from the questions, is that there's no, when I'm working with NEO or working with another graph database, there's no data model to look at. It's literally these instances. So if you see on the right, the graph there is the actors, is the movies. It's not an entity. But do you notice anything? 
is that in this another representation of the graph is while the instances are in the boxes and the actual relationships are on the lines, is that we have these things that look a lot like attributes, the properties or the labels. And I think this means there is a data model, and I'm going to show you that in a minute. The way we now ask a question with Cypher is instead of saying a select, we say match. So basically go find all these things. So in this particular model, the instance is you, who has these friends, and we have Anna and Johan and Andrew and Julia and Rajesh and Amanda, and what they've worked with and what they like. So basically, this is asking this particular query, notice there's a function here called shortest path. We don't have that in the relational world. I want to say, What's the shortest path between me and someone who's an expert? And the expert part of this is not on that graph. So if I said that someone was an expert in something or someone had a role of an expert, I could just go ask the graph, just go tell me the shortest path. If we had to write this in SQL, we'd have to go scan our our many-to-many -many relationships, which means we'd have to read every single row. Because if you need to know the shortest path through something, you'd have to go read every row, find all the paths, which for some networks or hierarchies could be millions and millions of rows, and then figure out which ones were the shortest. That's why having a database that specializes in these types of queries is going to perform better. Uh, IBM also has a graph as database, so it's a database as a service. So I said Neo was something that you could download and install. IBM Graph, which is brand new, um, has database as a service through their Bluemix service. And their graph, same concepts, they're vertexes or vertices, and then they have edges. And basically what you do when you create a graph here, um, and in this particular example, you can see that we're creating a graph of what looks like airports. So LES is McCarran Airport in Las Vegas, Nevada, and we have a latitude and longitude, um, and we're creating this particular, this is the programming language that is creating one, one node, one vertex, vertex in their graph. And then when you query it, they're using a language, uh, uh, an approach with Gremlin that allows them to go get, and in this case, I've forgotten now what this is an example of, um, is that, oh, we're finding a route from an origin to a destination, and we're able to query, this is a different graph, but we're able to do that. So what are the things you notice? Both the IBM graph and the Neo4j, it's all text. Right now it's command line stuff. And that, you know, it's not like opening up SQL Server Management Studio or some third party tool and working with the database. Part of this, the tiny bit of it, is that these are all brand new database systems and they are database engines primarily. There are third parties or open source projects working on tooling that goes all around it. People do this all the time. They go through a web browser, they do all this. And in fact, some of the resources I've listed allow you to do just that. But the real engine is, this, these are not replacements to Oracle, IBM, or any of those things where you would rip out SQL Server and replace it with one of these graphs. Is the ideal situation, as I talked about in hybrid, is that you would take maybe your transactional data and put your graph stories into a graph database so that you could ask these questions, these questions that are harder and more expensive and take longer in relational over here. That doesn't mean, though, that it's a read-only thing. So these graph engines have, depending on which ones that you're looking have, have different um, levels of ACID, which is sort of transactional support. Um, and both of these support transactions, both, but there are other systems that don't have that yet. So here's another model of the IBM graph um, taken from their documentation. And you can see it's also a film-related one. So we have a film 
a million dollar baby and it has an actor and that actor is appeared in the film and this has it. So it looks, you know, these are circles and lines and you can see we haven't set up the relationship between Arnold and the Terminator. So it looks just like our traditional data models with the exception of that in the actual graph, the boxes and lines or circles and lines are actual instances of the data. So another um, example that I'm showing you here is Titan. Now a bunch of NoSQL databases um, are available that use this open source product, this Titan database. You also see Gremlin here too. So this example came from Datastax. So because Titan can use several di different um, databases or data stores or data sources to serve up these graph, uh, graphs. So for instance, Titan can work with Cassandra um, as its source data and now you can do uh, graph functions against it. So in this case, uh, Titan in their examples um, uses gods and, mon and monsters as part of their sub sample set. So we can see Hercules, um, we can see all these things. As a data modeler, when I look at these, I see roles and I see verbs that I want to standardize and I see properties or attributes that I want to standardize. In fact, even on the right, you can see that Titan has some data types. Don't those look familiar? Um, our existing data models have an applicability here because we've already documented at least what we think all of these things, the data types should be and what we should be calling them. Now, the big question is what tools do we use for these? So as far as I know, Erwin ER Studio and Power Designer have no native support for these graph databases. Um, where they would, in theory, is when there is ODBC connectivity to these databases. The trade-off with that is if I were going to reverse this graph, so the one from the matrix, and I had ODBC connectivity, I would get back into my tools something that looked like an entity for every node. I don't want that in my data modeling tool. I have other ways of visualizing graphs other than using my data modeling tool. And also that could be problematic if I had a million or a billion nodes in my graph. Think about that data model. Where I think we're going to go, and one of the things I want to play with is the fact that I think I could take a very simple data model, and I'll show you some examples, not in a data modeling tool, but in a minute, that I could create in order to generate the names of the nodes, the properties of them that we specifically want in a graph, um, and the relationship names, maybe, and that I could take that information and the data types that we already have and have already decided and already decided whether we're going to call things customers or clients, and I could generate a start for this, not as structure, but as a way of ensuring that we don't spend a lot of time thinking about what we're going to call things in the graph unless we have to, and the fact that um, you know, that we would want to be able to have standardized names. So in other words, data governance and data stewardship. So I already talked about, we hear a lot that there's no data model in the graph. I think there is one. It's just not the same as the ERDs that we think about. Um, but that model isn't a structure. It's a, a I see, I don't want to say conceptual model because that means something else either. It's a, maybe it's a type of semantic model, I'm not sure. It's something where I want to write down how we want to talk about this data and then try to ensure that we have some consistency as we use these things across many databases. I think we can use that model to design the graphs. But we'll have the same issues that we have with traditional modeling. Trying to get consistent naming, not having overlapping names like the word job, which could be a construction job and could also be a task for a printer and could also be someone's position in HR. That we have these same issues with properties and rules and consistencies. Now one of the things you might have noticed about the graph is 
there's not a lot of constraints in there. There's really none. I mean, the only constraints we have is if we go crazy with the properties and we don't, um, if we call the same thing different things or inconsistently call the same property something different, then we might not be able to query the data and we might get bad queries coming back. But that consistency, the way we do it in a relational model is by everything in the same table means the same thing and all the columns, all the instances of a column, a cell in a relational table, we refer to it by the same thing, not so much in all these other NoSQL solutions. So we have still the same modeling and data governance problems. We'll just need to go about dealing with them differently, especially based on what type of graph we're building. If we're building a transactional graph where it's our source and our gold record of this data, we probably want to have more governance. If we're exporting a bunch of customer interactions and web clicks and bringing in a bunch of data from a whole bunch of sources to see what sort of questions we can ask it, then we wouldn't have a lot of governance coming in. We would just bring in the data and we would have to do sort of the forensic modeling of knowing that person and people and employee are things that we should be matching up. So I'd say that there's no logical and physical data model to the graph because your physical model is actually your instances. But I put an asterisk there because of some data models I'm going to show you um, in a minute. Um, the graph people like to talk about that you do a lot of whiteboard data modeling, and that just means that the graph model itself isn't overly complex. We don't have 10,000 symbols. We don't have you know, 20 different ways of expressing a relationship. We have one with some properties on it. Um, but I think traditional data models and therefore traditional data modelers have, the, have a role here. So where this all comes into play is traditionally if we do data model driven development, we have requirements and we create this beautiful ERD and then we generate a database and we might add some stuff that aren't in our model and then our requirements change and then we go through this all again. Well, in this, especially in the NoSQL world, but in the graph world, we might not be starting with requirements. So, um, you know, the recent news about the Panama Papers and the investigative journalism I mean, those people didn't start with a model and say, this is where we're going to wedge all the data. They took data from all kinds of sources to track who knew what people, who went to the same places, who had businesses with the same people, who banked at the same bank, you know, what banks had the same staff. They got that data from all kinds of sources. They bring that all into a graph, and then they have to figure out how they're going to bring all that data together. So it's kind of like working with a package that was developed, an application package that was developed over years by lots and lots of different people with no standards because it's data from sources that were never intended to be brought together. So that, the type of modeling activities, I, can, I call it either forensic or archaeological data modeling, is that you're not specifying a structure over everything. You're you're deriving the meaning of all of these data sources via a graph. So when they say there's no model, one of the interesting things about the gists, these sample data models that you can go play with, is that all their documentation starts out with these things to try to explain when you go to do a query in my graph, here's what I called the things. And you can see the whiskey one up in the top left-hand corner where the purple means whiskey and they had a flavor group and a location or region, right? That looks like one of our, that looks like a conceptual model, not a conceptual data model, not a formal conceptual model, but these are concepts. These are things that appear in that graph and what they called them. You can see one over here with people. Um, oh, this is a Game of Thrones just that's out there where they keep track of people and houses and groups and things that happen to them. I love this one complex relationship, set of relationships. And then there is a Santa one where there's a planet and sectors and regions. 
Those look a lot like data models to me. And maybe what happens is we will model these things after they're created, after we've done this. Because one of the other things is because we're not specifying a structure to it, one of the interesting things about graphs is there's a lot of talk when people talk about them is putting your data in, playing with it, seeing if it works, if it's answering the question, if you can ask the questions that you wanted to, if, it, if now by looking at the data, you found new questions to ask it, so you want to make an adjustment, so you blow it away and rebuild it again and bring the data in. I mean, those, that type of graph usage is you don't know all your data stories up front. So I'd say the modeling happens both at the beginning, if you're trying to do good data governance and good consistency to save time and to make the data more reusable, but we're also going to have a big role of perhaps documenting the decisions that were made so that someone sitting down to write one of these queries knows, oh, it's called a region here and not an area, and a sector, see, I know contains a planet, that a sector doesn't contain regions. This, to me, a data model for a graph database. And I see these all the time as people talk about it, even while they're saying a graph database has no model. So some tips for everybody. Understand the use cases for graph technologies. You have them right now on your projects, and you might not even realize it. You're going to evaluate and profile your data to see if it works with graphs. You need to investigate if you're going to use one of these graphs, and there's a whole bunch, whole, there are many more graph solutions than what I showed here, especially in the triple store areas. Um, that transactional support is going to vary, and you'll want to test your use cases for it. You want your queries, data stories, the questions you want to ask your data to guide your decisions, and you may change that a lot. Um, you, need to you need to test your current development tools for support and your database and data modeling tools. We definitely want to leverage our existing metadata models, and a lot of the people talking about graph databases think there's no use for them. I think there is. Um, I think true hierarchies are very rare in the real world, and probably every true hierarchy has an exception to prove that it's not. Um, there's some sort of rule that I shouldn't make up for that. Um, you need to ask questions on the teams about exceptions to hierarchies and rules and keep asking where the data integrity is going to happen or is relevant. So I gave you lots of graph stories where we might care about the data integrity and other stories where we don't want to impose integrity on it, not in the graph database. So before I get to resources, um, let me check out some of the questions. Um, we discuss graph add-on functionality that both Oracle and Tata, Teradata Aster offer. Um, I don't know a lot about it, but I do know that those features are embedded in Oracle. I haven't had a chance to play with them, um, but that's also an example of a relational system, a relational database vendor adding graph features to a relational database. Are geographic information systems based on graph databases? That's a good question. Um, most of the GIS systems I worked with predated all of these graph databases that are current now, so I don't have an answer to that. Um, if anyone else knows about that, that's a great question, and I would think they would be a good case. So definitely locations, like definitely the geographic data stories where we consider things inside other things and related to things would be a great case for that. Um, any res uh, resources or relations with ontologies? So I did say that triple stores came out of the semantic world, and I haven't had a lot of chance to play with them, but that is, it was in my studies of, of RDF and uh, other ontology things is where I was first introduced to graph databases. So I'm sure there are resources out there um, related to that, but I don't have any for you today. Uh, let's see, so some resources. Um, there's some learning stuff if you want to go play with Neo. So, and again, you're going to get the slides. So here's a Belgian beer one. See, 
I'm noticing a pattern here with these. Yeah. Um, the fun with drafts, the ones I like. So there are fun ones, and then there are some really serious ones for forensics and access control and everything. And that's where you can have fun. You don't have to install anything to go play with these. You can even move the nodes around, but you can write your own queries. You can do all the things that you want to do with it on this website. I said that IBM has this brand new uh, graph database as a service. You get that by signing up with Bluemix. They do have a free trial where you can go just in minutes, set up what I think is a one-week uh, play area. It might be longer than that, I can't remember. Or if you're an IBM shop, you might already have Bluemix credits for dealing with this. Um, and this is database as a service, so not anything you have to install. Here's the trees and hierarchies book that I recommend if you're working with things in the relational world with all those relational tricks for making hierarchies and trees work. I also wrote a white paper um, about your master data on a graph, which is an introduction to graph, and that's available out on Dataversity as well. Uh, there's O'Reilly has a book that was written by people at Neo4j that you can download free as an ebook uh, that's in a second edition if you want to deal with that. Um, I mentioned that I started all this in the NoSQL world, um, and actually Joey D'Antoni and I at EDW gave a workshop uh, just last week about seven databases in seven weeks. Um, I don't know that this one's been updated. I haven't go, gone to look, but it also has some tutorials across all kinds of, of NoSQL databases that I recommend for someone getting started with all this. And all this comes down to is that um, every design decision includes cost, benefit, and risk. And anyone you're talking to, whether they're on the graph side, the relational side, any of the no other NoSQL ones, if they are talking to you about why relational's dead or why relational failed, or why graph databases are never going to be anything. Anyone who's talking to you that way, instead of here's the use case that you would use to work for this type of data story, they're not talking to you as an architect. They're either talking to you as a marketer or someone who's on team relational and not on team data. Every design decision comes down to cost, benefit, and risk. And I'd say every data modeler who isn't within a year of retirement needs to start at least going understand, going out and understanding how these things work and what are the right times to work with them. So that's all I had for today. I'm not seeing um, mention that navigation systems are graphs. Yeah. So one of the things is, is um, you know, there's a sticker you can get that says graphs are everywhere. It's like once you start playing with these graph things, you realize everything's a graph. And part of that's because we still think in terms of graphs just because of relational database. And we do think about customers being connected to products, being connected to manufacturers. I mean, at a very high level, even a relational database, our data is always related. The difference is, is that Relational databases are fantastic at data integrity, data quality, normalized data, fact once, preserving that integrity through all the updates and changes, and also in data warehousing and analytics for all kinds of other things. But there are these niche cases where no matter what we do to a table, we're not going to be able to easily and quickly ask it these questions. And the other big thing about NoSQL is that it's schema on read, not schema on write. So we're allowed to work with dirtier data or data we don't understand and all these other things that a good relational design wouldn't let us do. Of course, we can always put dirty data in a bad relational design. So. Oh, look, one more minute. So that's all I had for today. I'm glad you joined me. I'm glad I got some interesting questions. And I'm going to stay on for a little bit longer in case you have some after the recording goes off. Karen, thank you so much for another great presentation as always. And thanks to our attendees for the great questions and interaction. Just a reminder, I will be sending out a copy, a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides, 
links to the recording of the session and anything else requested throughout. Now I will turn off the recording to have a, a, an additional dialogue.